All right, can I have your attention? If you just come back to your seats, we're about to get started with the second part of our apologetics double feature. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to present to you Dr. Neil Shinvey, who has a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of California at Berkeley. And um, I'm just sort of nervous thinking about the math test that he and Tim could put together for us. Um, I'm hoping that that, that doesn't come up. Um, but uh, Neil, just in the, the little time that I've gotten to spend with him, I'm not only just really, really impressed with the gifted intellect that the Lord has given him, but the great passion that he has for the Lord Jesus as well. So please welcome to the platform, Neil Shinvey. Uh, let's just pray quickly. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you, uh, though you're glorious, though you're great and good, that you've made a way for us to know you, to be forgiven, even though we're sinners. I pray that uh, what I say tonight would be helpful to people, and that if uh, non-Christians are listening and are interested, that you would, uh, you would be with me to give me the words to speak, and that they would, uh, that they would be able to understand what I say. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, how, can I, how can I go after Tim, right? It's like the prime time, post-Super Bowl time slot, uh, I, the, the coveted spot. Uh, but it's hard to beat a talk like that. But let me start this talk the way that all good talks should start, with a meme. <laughs> so this. In our modern age, sorry, I'll stand in front of the mic here. In our modern age of science and technology, when, when you say that you believe in God, this is what people often think of. The ancient aliens guy. Crazy, deluded, weird hair. Uh, let me ask for a show of hands. How many of you have atheist or agnostic friends who've asked you challenging questions about the compatibility of religion and science? pretty much everybody. Um, so this question is uh, important in today's culture for both Christians and non-Christians. For Christians, especially those studying at universities, science is often claimed to be in opposition to religion. Uh, people say that it can answer all the questions which were once answered by religion. Well, conversely, for non-Christians, science is sometimes advanced as an insurmountable obstacle to the Christian faith. If we really believe in the validity and the truth of science, we can really ignore the claims of Jesus. Well, I want to speak to both Christians and non-Christians tonight. I know to talk like this, almost all of you are present Christians, but you know, there are people out there who might have come in from, from the public, people listening online. I want to talk to everybody. I, uh, my goal is to clear away whatever difficulties are preventing us from taking the Christian faith seriously or from living it out confidently. I'm going to argue not only that science uh, does not pose a conflict with religion, but that science can give us good reason to believe that God exists. Now, I know this is quite a challenge, and many of you are probably thinking to yourselves, you know, one does not simply reconcile science and religion. <laughs> if I can't do that, though, just in this short span, I agree, it's a, it's a big conversation, but I hope I can point you in the right direction. So here's my outline. I want to start with some definitions, always important to define our terms. I'll then look at four major classes of claimed conflict between science and religion and show why I don't think any of them are valid. Third, I'll look at some evidence that can point us towards God rather than away from him that we can, we can glean from science. And finally, I'll ask a question that's pretty, pretty interesting and yet not often addressed in talks like these. If God does exist, why isn't there more scientific evidence that he exists? Why, why is God seemingly hidden? I'm going to give I'm gonna quite a quick Christian's with ways to answer that question. Let's begin with definitions. First, what, what is science? Uh, if you look at the dictionary, you get a rough definition like this. Well, science is an approach to knowledge that utilizes the scientific method. If you remember back to middle school, junior high, high school, uh, that consists of roughly four steps. Observation, you see something in nature, you form a hypothesis about why it's happening, you do experiments, key step, experiments to test that hypothesis, which you can then revise if you need to. So here, science is defined methodologically as a way of approaching to truth that uses the uh, method, the scientific method. Uh, now, what is religion? 
Well, sociologists will argue for hours over this question. I mean, is, is Zen Buddhism a religion? I mean, because Zen Buddhists don't necessarily believe in God. Uh, is, is Marxism a religion? Because there are a lot of sort of dogmatic assumptions about the trajectory of history embedded in Marxism. But I think tonight, for this, this talk, we'll define religion to be synonymous with monotheism, the belief that there is a, a good, personal, transcendent creator and sustainer of the universe, God. Okay, so now that we've defined our terms, uh, let's look at four areas of claimed conflict. Uh, these are not just one conflict, there, there are many. I think I've there are four general categories. Uh, definitional, metaphysical, epistemological, and evolutionary. Let's start with definitional. So here we see three quotes from uh, some neo-atheists, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens. I'll read the Dawkins quote. I can't do his, his wonderful uh, Oxford accent. I, I'm from Delaware, I apologize. Uh, but he says, another meme of the religious meme complex is called faith. It means blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence. And you see Harris and, and Hitchens saying similar things. So the, the, the new atheists here are defining faith as belief without evidence. Now, is that, uh, is that a good definition? What's the problem with that? Well, well, no, that is not a good definition of faith. That is not how Christians have understood the concept of faith for thousands of years or how the Bible even uses the word faith. The Greek word pistis, which is translated as faith in modern Bibles, uh, really better refers to personal trust. It doesn't refer to belief that evidence. This is not unusual. If I talk about having faith in my wife, do I mean that I believe that she exists without any evidence? No, of course not. I mean that I trust my wife. Now, is that trust necessarily opposed to evidence? Of course not. Over the last 13 years of marriage, she's given me plenty of evidence to believe that she is trustworthy, that she loves me, that she keeps her promises. Now, the same is true of God. Faith is not opposed to evidence uh, because our trust in God can be based on evidence that he exists, that he's good, and is worthy of our confidence. So this first idea that, that science is based on evidence while religion is based on faith is predicated on a faulty understanding of biblical faith and therefore is not a real conflict between science and religion. Next, let's look at a second area of claimed conflict, that of metaphysics. Here again, three quotes. The first from the Humanist Manifesto 2. It basically says, look, uh, nature might be bigger than we realize now, but any new scientific evidence will simply illuminate or enlarge our understanding of the natural. Here are a few more quotes from uh, Nobel laureate James Watson, poet Matthew Arnold. And if you're not familiar with these sources, maybe here's another one for you. Uh, this is from the, the modern classic Nacho Libre. And if you've seen this movie, you should be ashamed of your taste in movies. I don't even know how this slide got on this, in this presentation. So there's no, there's no reference made here to, to faith. Instead, we're told that science shows somehow that nature is all that exists. Is that true? Does science really show us that nature is all that exists? Well, no, no. The position that nature is all that exists is a philosophical position known as naturalism. This is not a scientific proposition. I mean, after all, uh, what, what experiment shows us, proves to us that nature is all that exists? Uh, there, there isn't one. I mean, is there some napkin somewhere with a list of all existing entities on it? And I get some competent scientists like Professor Frank here, and I show him the napkin, and I say, look, this is all the stuff that exists. Show me, do an experiment, and, and what's on that list? And he says, well, I see rocks and planets and stars and pizza and books, but I don't see God or angels or demons or unicorns on there. They must not exist. There, there's no such experiment. Of course not. I think the confusion here lies in mistaking methodological naturalism for metaphysical naturalism. Me what does that mean? Well, methodolog methodological naturalism is the assumption that we make when we're science, so oftentimes, that, that non-natural entities, if they do exist, will not interfere with my experiment. Now, I have to make that assumption for the purposes of, of interpreting my experiment consistently, right? I, ha I have to do that. Uh, but that does not entail that metaphysical naturalism mystery doesn't entail that there are no non-natural entities. Let me show you how this works. Imagine I go to a toxicologist and I say, I, you know, I'm feeling really sick, I have a headache, I have a fever, I'm just feeling really rotten. So he runs every test he knows and he comes back to me and says, you know, I've run every test that I know of. I, I can't find anything. Your symptoms must be caused by some unknown poison. So I say to the toxicologist, I, I guess so, but maybe I just have a cold. 
He gets all red in the face, his veins pop out, and he says, I'm a toxicologist. I don't believe in colds. Now, what we do? We do this. What? Are you kidding me? But he's confusing methodology with metaphysics. Right? He, you know, he, he's a toxicologist. Of course, for the sake of his profession, he assumes that whatever my symptoms are, they're caused by some poison. He's a toxicologist. That's his job. But it doesn't follow that there are no other possible causes for my symptoms, right? But can't scientists make the same mistake? When, when they exa examine a phenomenon with no known natural cause, they say there must be some unknown natural cause. I'm a scientist. I don't believe in supernatural causes. Now, there is a potential conflict here, but it's not between science and God. It's between naturalism and theism. These are two philosophical positions. Let's consider a third potential area here, that of epistemology. Here's some quotes from Hawking, Robert Reich, Jerry Coyne. Hawking basically says, science is based on observation and reason, while religion is based on authority. Uh, you know, and, and uh, Reich, Coyne say similar things. And so is that true? And to put it more colloquially, bro, do you even science? They misspelled you here. It should be a single letter. Just do you even science? Now, again, what's the claim here? The claim here is that uh, science and religion approach epistemology differently. Epistemology is the study of how we know truth. And the claim underlying this objection is often the idea of uh, the position of scientism. It's the idea that science is the only way to know truth. Well, is that claim true? Is scientism true? No, it's actually self-refuting and therefore necessarily false. When someone says science is the only way to know truth, you merely have to ask them, do you know the truth of that statement through science? What experiment did you do to prove that science is the only way to know truth? Well, that's a philosophical claim. But there's, and there's another way to know truth, philosophy. So it's self-refuting and therefore false. And they say, that was like a Jedi mind trick. Let me try again. Science is the only reliable way to know truth. OK. Do you know the, state, the truth of that statement reliably? It is also self-refuting. So the, the, the most optimistic claim you can make is to say, science is the best way to know truths which can be known through science. I can kind of get behind that, I think, but, it, but clearly it doesn't represent a conflict between science and religion. Lastly, claims of evolutionary conflict. This picture has no relevance to my talk. It just, I think it's hilarious. So Richard Dawkins, again, a very prominent evolutionary biologist, atheist, vocal atheist, he says, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It basically says here and elsewhere that belief in evolution necessarily leads to atheism. So is that, is that the case? You know, is, does belief in evolution necessarily entail atheism? Before we can answer that question, we have to define evolution very carefully. What do we mean by evolution? Uh, we have to define it before we can examine whether and how evolution is incompatible with God's existence. So what is evolution? Well, modern evolutionary theory is based on three foundational premises. Number one, that there's been a change in the species of life on Earth over Earth's history. Number two, that all species are descended from a single ancestral life form. This idea is known as universal common descent. And number three, that random mutation and natural selection are the primary drivers of modern biodiversity. Now, which of these premises conflicts with the existence of God? Well, surprisingly, the first premise that, 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 that species in, on, on, of life on Earth have changed over Earth's history, this premise is almost universally accepted even among young Earth creationists. I mean, no one thinks there are dinosaurs running around in Iowa right now, right? So everyone agrees that some life that once existed doesn't exist anymore, that li the, life, the species have changed over Earth's history. That's not controversial. The second premise is a bit more controversial. But again, actually, there's more agreement than you might think. For instance, creationists accept a limited form of common descent, just not universal common descent. So they'd place limits on how much change can occur within a given population, but they'd actually affirm that a lot of modern distinct species shared a common ancestor. So they'd put limits on common descent, but they'd actually agree that uh, there's a lot more agreement than you might think. And actually, many people in the, in the much maligned intelligent design community, at least in the sciences, uh, are willing to accept universal common descent wholesale. So they're in full agreement on this point with modern evolutionary theory. Now, not, not all proponents of intelligent design would do that, but some would. 
So the real source of conflict is over the third premise, this idea that random mutation and natural selection are the primary drivers of all modern biodiversity. So has science demonstrated unequivocally that this third pillar of neo-Darwinian synthesis is, is true? Well, no. Let me give you two reasons why, one philosophical, the other scientific. <clears throat> so philosophically, uh, the crux of the debate is in what we mean by the word random, when we talk about random mutations. Scientifically, this word carries a very technical meaning. It contrasts Darwinian evolution to Lamarckian inheritance. A random mutation in this sense is one that occurs independent of its environment, as opposed to a non-random mutation, which is an adaptive response to the environment. Now, this kind of randomness says nothing at all about God's existence or even his interaction with the world. It merely says the mutations appear to occur at a rate and in locations that are not dependent on the environment. That's all. Unfortunately, people sometimes confuse this very limited technical sense of randomness, meaning independent of the environment, with a very different sense of randomness, meaning absolutely uncaused, undirected, and unguided. It's the second kind of randomness which is problematic for theism, but only because it excludes God by definition. Even God cannot cause, direct, and guide an absolutely uncaused, undirected, unguided process. But the second kind of randomness is not a scientific description of an event. It's a metaphysical interpretation of an event. So once again, we don't have a conflict between science and God, but between naturalism and theism, two philosophical ideas. But second, even apart from philosophical considerations, this third pillar of evolutionary theory, the crucial one, is the most difficult to probe experimentally. Since creationists are willing to concede at least some degree, large degree, of biological change within populations, and certainly the kinds of things we see today in lab, in the, in the, in the change microevolution of bacteria, viruses, things like that, the resistance to antibiotics, well then proponents of evolution would have to show evidence that really large evolutionary changes can be driven purely by random mutation and natural selection. Unfortunately, because macroevolution occurs on geologic timescales of millions of years and usually proceeds in very small increments, this type of evidence is extremely sparse. I think both sides of the debate would agree that evolutionary support for this third, evidentiary support for this third pillar, the crucial one, the key point of conflict between critics and proponents of evolution, is based upon a, a substantial extrapolation from the current evidence. Now, I can't delve into related objections like, well, evolution explains morality, evolution explains religion, but I think these two objections pretty clearly show that, uh, that the current evidence of, for biological evolution is not in conflict with God's existence. Uh, for both philosophical and scientific reasons, it's possible to reject the claim that evolution demonstrates that God does not exist or that he's not the creator of life on Earth, whether through an evolutionary mechanism or not. Okay, so I, I hope I've shown you then, just briefly sketched why I think there's no inherent conflict between science and religion. But is that all we can say? When we say, well, there's no conflict, good. Well, I think we can say a lot more than that. I think we can show that they can, we can make a positive case for God's existence from science. But before I do that, let me say a brief word, especially to people in the audience who, who are sort of skeptical. Uh, and certainly as Christians, you should make this distinction very clear. I cannot, make, I cannot give you proof from science that God exists. Now, why is that? Because science doesn't deal in proof. Mathematics deals in proof, usually, sometimes, hopefully. But science really produces proof. Instead, it produces evidence. As scientists, we look at the evidence, we, we gather evidence, and then we seek to, look at the, to find the best explanation for the evidence we have at our disposal. The question I'm asking tonight is not, can I prove that God exists? But I'll give you five pieces of evidence and ask you which worldview better explains the evidence? Which worldview is more consistent with the evidence? Theism or naturalism? That's the question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to equate atheism with naturalism. I realize that a lot of philosophers are upset by that, but I think when you talk to the average atheist, they're naturalists today. Okay, so what are those five pieces of evidence? Uh, I'll go through them each in turn and explain them very briefly. They're, they're, they're really interesting. I could add, add more than this. Let's start with mathematics. Eugene, don't read all this stuff. This is, by the way, these, these, these slides, I violated every possible rule of PowerPoint in making these slides. 
they're there not for you to read, but for you to uh, access online, look at them later, just so you have them, you know, if you want uh, added information. So you can ignore the text right now. Uh, Nobel laureate Eugene Wigner wrote a very famous paper, and a very accessible paper, entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. In that paper, he observes that the remarkable success of mathematics in describing the physical world is actually very surprising. He repeatedly uses the words miracle and miraculous to describe this phenomenon. Now, I have no idea whether he was a Christian, whether he even believed in God. I don't know. But he kept using these words. And he said, why? What are these two phenomena that he points out? He says, well, number one, he says, it's not metaphysically necessary that the universe has this deep underlying mathematical structure. It does, but, but why? I mean, we could imagine a universe very easily that was completely chaotic, uh, governed by no underlying mathematics at all. We could imagine universes that were sort of partially chaotic, w w with regularity in space and in, in time, but then it was periodically interrupted by chaos. So maybe the laws of nature in one laboratory are different than in another laboratory. Maybe laws of nature in one planet are different than on another planet. Uh, maybe every Wednesday the laws of nature stop working. We could imagine that, but we don't find that at all. We see a universe with this incredibly uh, structured and what's more beautiful mathematics that describes everything. And Vig not me, Wigner says, why? That's weird. That's first. Number two, he says, in addition to this fact, why are human beings alone able to perceive and understand this structure? Wigner says this fact is also quite surprising. I mean, you could say, oh, well, evolution, that explains it, because evolution selects for intelligent organisms. No, no, hold on. I can understand why it might confer reproductive benefit to be intelligent enough to avoid being eaten by a tiger or falling off a cliff. But why is it that human beings can understand topology, right, or, or molecular biology? Why? That seems way so far above and beyond what's needed for survival. In fact, science didn't exist in its current form for like the last 300 years. So why do we alone have this ability? Think about it. I mean, there are other intelligent animals, chimpanzees, dolphins, they're very intelligent. They come nowhere near our innate capacity for understanding things like math and science, for abstract reasoning. And Wigner says, why is this? In fact, Albert Einstein, a famous quote, he said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. That encompasses both of these points, is that one, the universe is comprehensible in some sort of objective sense, then number two, that we can even understand, our, as human beings, we can understand it. Why? Why? Now, that makes a lot of sense if Christianity is true, because Christians believe that God is infinitely wise and intelligent and created the world, and so the universe reflects his order and, and brilliance and, 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 and rationality. What's more, Christians believe that, that God made human beings in his image in order to appreciate the universe he created. The, the Bible's full of statements like we should, we should love and, and, and glorify God for his brilliance and that we should see it reflected in, in nature. But what if you're a naturalist? What if you're an atheist? What explains these two phenomena? There's not any good explanation. It's just, they're just there. That's number one. Number two, the beginning of the universe. The vast majority of modern astronomers now believe the universe is not eternal, it had a beginning about 14.3 billion years ago, give or take a few hundred million years, I'm not a cosmologist, in an event known as the Big Bang. Now what most people don't know is that this model was resisted for decades because it contradicted the prevalent belief of astronomers that the universe was eternal. That belief went back to at least the ancient Greeks. As recently as 1989, what is that now, 27 years ago? The editor of Nature magazine, this is one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world, he wrote the Big Bang is philosophically unacceptable and that creationists uh, uh, seeking support for their opinion have ample justification in the doctrine of the Big Bang. Now you can kind of see why he said that. Why is the Big Bang problematic for naturalists? Well, if the universe is eternal, and you say, well, what caused it? Well, nothing. It's always been here. There's no need for a cause. But wait a minute. If the universe actually began to exist, now we have to ask that question. Well, wouldn't something or someone have to have caused it to come into being? And if all of time and space and matter and even nature itself came into being at the Big Bang, then wouldn't the cause, whatever it is, have to be outside of time and space and matter, even outside of nature itself, at least be, be extra natural? 
Now, while this observation doesn't prove that the cost is God, I think it's very suggestive. But even more than that, what's suggestive is the recently discovered fine-tuning of the universe. Again, last few decades this has come out. So the standard model of physics is our best working model for understanding the interaction of uh, fundamental forces and subatomic particles. But this model includes a number of, of independent parameters, just numbers you plug into the equations, but you have to derive them from, you have to get them from experiment. You can't derive them theoretically from equations. I'd love to on my blackboard, but I can't. You just have to measure them. These are things like the ratio of the strong force to the, gravita or the, to the, to the gravitational force or the cosmological constant. These are numbers you just get from observing nature. You plug them into the equations, and they tell you how the universe runs. Now, what physicists have recently discovered is that a number of these constants appear to be incredibly, exquisitely fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life somewhere in the universe. And if some of these constants have been changed even a fraction of a fraction of percent, life would be impossible anywhere in the universe. Now, the best example of, of fine, this fine-tuning is in the cosmological constant. That is finely tuned to one part in 10 to the 120th power. That's one part, I have to use my fingers now, in one trillion, 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 trillion. And this is just one example of the fine tuning that we observe in these fundamental constants and parameters which, which define our universe. And this is why both Christian and non-Christian physicists agree this is a real phenomenon. It's not just an artifact of our theories. Now, what's the, I mean, obviously Christian, what explains this? Well, Christian would say, well, look, God, purpose to create a universe with regular physical laws inhabited by physical beings like ourselves, and that's why the universe is the way it is. He designed it this way. That kind of makes sense. What's the best non-theistic explanation of this fine-tuning? Well, currently, many atheists posit the existence of uh, a, a near-infinite uh, infinite number of undetectable parallel universes called the multiverse. Now, in each of these parallel universes, the fundamental constants are very slightly, they're a little bit different, and as a result of this variation, uh, every possible value is sampled somewhere in this infinite multiverse. And we live in the universe in which all the constants line up in a way that life is possible in our universe. Now, there are actually physical, scientific objections to, the, to this hypothesis, but right now I want to focus not on those, but on just one very practical objection. You know, many atheists say to me, I, I could never believe in God. It just takes too much faith, it's too weird, it's too implausible. And I can kind of see emotionally how you'd feel that way. You know, but surely it takes at least a little bit of faith to believe that there exists an infinite number of undetectable parallel universes, right? I mean, after all, if an infinite multiverse really does exist, then there are actual universes out there in the multiverse in which pink unicorns exist. Pink unicorns with, with ten horns and feet made of pudding. Okay. The, there, there's a universe out there in the multiverse that actually exists that's composed entirely of gorgonzola cheese. Why dairy products? I don't know. It was funnier that way. Uh, so if, that, if, you know, if God's existence seems weird and implausible to you, would you at least concede that these ideas are at least a little implausible too? I think you can grant that. Fourth. I can't resist saying a little bit about quantum mechanics. This is my area of professional expertise. I don't think it provides reasons to think that God exists necessarily, but I think it does have some very interesting implications for a sort of naive view of reality or a naive naturalism. Let me list just two well-accepted features of quantum mechanics that are surprisingly not very well known to most non-physicists. First, quantum mechanics makes it extremely hard to identify inviolable laws of nature, so laws that can just never be violated. According to quantum mechanics, while events may be extremely improbable, very few events can be ruled out as absolutely impossible. For example, this is my favorite example, uh, there's a physicist uh, who was uh, helping to build the LHC, a big particle collider somewhere in Europe, I think, I forget where it is, uh, and, and a reporter from the New York Times asked him, is your machine going to destroy the world? This is like the plot of a bad movie, right? So, but is it going to do that? And he said, no, our machine is not going to destroy the world. Probably. But, he said, but, he said this, you know, he said, but, given the random nature of quantum physics, there's a non-zero chance of anything occurring that the new collider could spit out man-eating dragons. Now, he, he was 
joking a little. When he was, but he was technically just saying what I'm saying. There's a non-zero chance that basically anything could happen. Okay? Uh, so, so what that means then is that we can't say anymore that miracles are impossible. We can't say that. It just, even, forget, forget other arguments of philosophy, just saying it physically, scientifically. The laws of nature are, are sort of inherently, they seem to be probabilistic. We can't rule out miracles as impossible. And if God decided to intervene in the universe to perform a miracle, he could do so without violating any of the natural laws that he created. People say, that's so sloppy. Well, he wouldn't have to be sloppy. That's sort of built in to the laws of physics as we understand them currently. That's one, that's first point. Second. Quantum mechanics dictates that there are some entities that will never be accessible to observation. So in a Newtonian, a classical sort of 19th century universe, you could theoretically measure everything, every particle, every property of every particle in the entire universe, in principle with a good enough machine, with a good enough instrument. But according to quantum mechanics, the most fundamental unit of reality, the most fundamental description of reality is the wave function. And you can actually prove mathematically, it's called the no cloning theorem, that you cannot measure the wave function exactly. You can't. In fact, there's a whole field called quantum cryptography based on that theorem. So that's a kind of a bitter pill to swallow for many naturalists, many proponents of science. This, uh, this enlightenment idea that we can know everything through reason and science and observation. I'm sorry, quantum mechanics says there's a limit to what you can observe. There just is. It's fundamental. And finally, I'm not going to go into detail on this point, uh, but many of the founders of quantum mechanics, such as Nobel laureate Eugene Wigner, we talked about him, a mathematician, John von Neumann, brilliant mathematician, they believe that quantum mechanics demonstrates, proves, shows that consciousness plays a role that's distinct in the universe and different from matter. Now, their view is not the only one. It's not even that, that popular today, but... but, but you know, they really thought it was true, and I think it's certainly one of the positions out there today in physics. Uh, I think, I wouldn't go so far as they did and say it, it's proven by quantum mechanics. What I would say is this, I think it's con a conservative assessment would affirm that quantum mechanics makes it easier to affirm mind-body dualism. It's much more plausible now than it was in a Newtonian universe, okay? And if you want to hear more about quantum mechanics, I have a talk tomorrow, you'll learn all you care to know about quantum mechanics. Uh, so I, while I don't think that quantum mechanics provides direct evidence that God exists, I think it does challenge some of these very naive naturalistic ideas about reality in at least these three areas. The possibility of miracles, the fact that not all of reality is accessible to observation, and through the possibility, at least, the possibility that mind really is distinct from matter. Finally, I want to ask what the search for truth itself can tell us about God's existence. It seems like one prerequisite for the whole scientific enterprise is the assumption that truth is intrinsically good and that we ought to seek it. I mean, think about it. Most scientists, this is just an empirical observation, most scientists become scientists not because, not for, for the money and the fame, you know, haha, -ha, right? No, you know, of course no one does that. They become scientists because they actually are curious. They, they love to know the truth about things. They just like investigating the truth, right? And so, so, that's why most of my friends that are scientists became scientists. They just wanted to, to seek the truth. They wanted to know the truth. But if truth is not intrinsically good, then why seek the truth at all, I, either through science or any other means? So any worldview which cannot explain why we ought to seek the truth is going to undercut the very foundation of the entire scientific enterprise. So let's ask the question, is truth intrinsically good and should we seek to know the truth? Now, the difficulty arises when we try to explain why truth-seeking is intrinsically good or morally obligatory if naturalism is true, if nature is all that exists. Now, why is that? Well, look, most, most theories of morality on naturalism, most naturalistic theories of morality, tend to equate ultimate value and moral goodness with human flourishing. So if you wanted to explain why science and truth-seeking are good, if you're a naturalist or an atheist, here's what you could say. You'd say, well, look, uh, human flourishing is the ultimate good, right? We're agreed on that. It's what all of our ethical theories are based on. But truth promotes human flourishing. In fact, especially science. 
For example, we can use science to discover drugs to cure the sick. We can use science to, to, to invent ways to feed hungry people, right? So, so clearly, science is good because it promotes human flourishing. And then in the same way, truth is good because it promotes human flourishing. Now, that's how you would do it, but here's the problem. What you've done now is you've made truth an instrumental good, not an intrinsic good. And what, what do I mean by that? An, an intrinsic good is something that's good unto itself. It's an end unto itself. It's good because of what it is. An instrumental good is something that's good only insofar as it leads to some other good, or some other ultimate good. So in this case, we said, well, truth-seeking, truth, is, is instrumentally good because it leads to human flourishing. But so could other things. For instance, like, who doesn't like smooth jazz? It leads to human flourishing, so it's good. Papayas. Everyone loves papayas. They're good, too. They lead to human flourishing. Now, do you see the, you didn't see the problem? What happens if I hate smooth jazz? What happens if I'm allergic to papayas? Oh, well, if I, if I cut the connection between papayas or smooth jazz and human flourishing, well, then, then they're not good, right? What happens if we cut the connection between truth and human flourishing? What if they're in conflict? Simple example. You're, you know, you're an atheist, and let's say, for the sake of argument, let's say atheism is true. You're an atheist, atheism is true, and your Christian grandmother is dying. She calls you in to be with her in her last few hours, and she is clearly in incredible pain. She calls you in into her bedside, and she says to you, you know, I am suffering so tremendously, it's, it's terrible. The only thing that makes me able to just withstand this pain and even gives me joy in the midst of suffering is knowing that I'll soon be face to face with Jesus, who loves me, who died for me. That, that I'll be reunited with my husband, with my little infant who died. That's what gives me the possibility of being happy right now. Nothing else could. But tell me, atheist grandson, I hear there are some people who don't even believe that God exists. Is that true, atheist grandson? Should I seek to know the truth? Now, what do you tell her? I think you're morally obligated to lie to her, to urge her to not seek the truth. Why? Because in this case, very clearly, it will diminish her flourishing, and that is the ultimate good. And this gets worse. Uh, what if Bertrand Russell, Jean-Paul Sartre were right? in their assessment that atheism is a terrible, agonizing, miserable truth, they thought that people would be much happier believing that God exists rather than believing the miserable, awful truth of atheism. They believed it was a truth, they thought it was terrible truth and agonizing. Now, empirically, what if they were right? What if it just turns out, as a psychological fact, that most people are much happier, they flourish more believing some religious delusion rather than the truth of atheism? I think that as an atheist, you are morally obligated to promote the most ridiculous religious delusions if they lead to human flourishing and to suppress the truth if it does not lead to human flourishing. So it doesn't seem that naturalism can, can furnish us with any reason to think that truth is intrinsically good or that truth-seeking is morally obligatory. And that inability tends to undercut the entire scientific enterprise. Well, can any worldview explain why truth is intrinsically valuable and why truth-seeking is morally obligatory? Well, yeah, Christianity can. If a truth-loving God exists, and if he commands us to seek the truth, now we can explain why truth-seeking is good and obligatory. You know, and, and we can even resolve the tension between truth-seeking and human flourishing, right? Because sometimes truth is hard. If Christianity is true, then truth will ultimately lead to our eternal flourishing. Jesus said, he was the way, the truth, and the life, and the truth will set you free. So no matter what hardships or difficulties attend truth-seeking here, there will be no ultimate conflict at all between truth and our joy. So we have a very strange paradox here. Atheists who tend to rightly value truth very highly, good for them, have no way to explain why it's valuable. And this inability calls into question the whole practice of science which is founded on the assumption that truth is a good thing, intrinsically. Moreover, if an atheist approaches a Christian and says, you ought to abandon Christianity and seek the truth of atheism, I think the Christian is well within his rights to say, well, look, I, you know, I love God, I love Jesus, I love being a Christian. It makes me objectively a more compassionate, generous, kind person. So let me ask you a question. If you're right and atheism is actually true, 
should I seek to know the truth? Am I obligated to seek the truth? Is it intrinsically good? Because you have no answer for that question. On the other hand, Christians can always urge everyone to seek the truth because truth-seeking is intrinsically good and, and obligatory. God commands us to seek it. Look at the Bible, Proverbs, Psalms. It's all over the place. Seek truth, get knowledge, gain understanding. Seek them more than, than riches. I mean, so it's, the Bible's full of commands to seek the truth. So Christianity provides a foundation for truth-seeking and then for the entire scientific enterprise that's not available to atheists. Okay. Uh, thus far, I hope I've shown that there's no conflict between science and religion. I hope I've also given you some ways in which science can point you toward God rather than away from him. But I don't want to stop there. I want to tackle another question which I think is often overlooked in this whole discussion. Why isn't the scientific evidence for God's existence clearer? Even if we think that there's good evidence that God exists from science, like I do, why isn't it just absolutely undeniable? Why isn't God sort of given us even more evidence that he exists? Well, good question. I, I hope you guys, uh, some atheists and some ask that question, and I want to equip you guys to answer it, if you're not already, don't already know how to answer it. Uh, number one, I'd say, well, science is not the only means of truth. Well, this goes back to the scientism part of the talk. And so it seems foolish to demand that definitive evidence for God's existence must come through science. Why not through ethics or aesthetics arguments or existential arguments? I mean, there are other ways to, know, to, to acquire knowledge. In fact, it seems to me that there are many reasons to expect that God would not use science as the primary vehicle for his revelation. For example, uh, at what state of scientific progress should God have stopped and made his existence clear? I mean, modern science has been around for like 300 years. So should God have left himself without a witness to humanity for millennia until we caught up to him in terms of, you know, biology and chemistry and physics? Well, that can't, that can't be right. And, and what about differences, individual differences now, in, in ability? I mean, some people have PhDs. Other people are illiterate. It, if God says, okay, you, you'll know that I exist if you can understand, say, graph theory, right? Well, he's living out the vast majority of human beings throughout history. And God wants to be accessible not just to some elite few, but to everybody. So again, another good reason he wouldn't choose science as the primary mode of his revelation. Third, uh, what about the cultures that just don't care that much about science? I mean, some cultures value other things. We value science as a sort of Western culture. Other cultures value things like art, uh, music, tradition, experience. Now, we could look at those cultures, oh, they're primitive and backwards. But, you know, God doesn't think that way. God wants to be known by them as much as he wants to be, to be known by us. So I think for all these reasons, it makes sense that God would not limit his revelation to science and certainly wouldn't use it as the main tool for his communication with humanity. Okay, you know, a skeptic might say, okay, okay, I get that, sort of get that. Uh, maybe God has reasons to, to reveal himself through more than just science. Okay. But that still doesn't make any sense. I mean, God should give us more evidence, even considered in its totality, right? Considering all the evidence from all disciplines, why is there more evidence? Why is God seemingly hidden? I mean, if God's omnipotent, he can do anything he wants. Uh, why not just write John 316 in, in, you know, mile-high letters on the moon in every language on the, on the earth? Why not rearrange the stars to spell out God exists, uh, you know, in, in the Milky Way? Uh, why not teleport copies of the King James Bible into every hotel room nightstand? No, well, the Gideons beat him to that one, you know. Uh, but why doesn't God just do some unmistakable sign from heaven to just show, to, to prove that he exists to us? I think it's a, it's a good question, and plenty of people have addressed that question. Let me give you one, I think, very important answer. So, uh, and it, we have to take a harder look, then, at the, the biblical doctrine of sin. I'm going to argue that evidence is not the ultimate issue. Believe it or not, uh, your intellectual objections and mine are not the ultimate reason for our mistrust of God. Remember, faith is trust. The opposite of, of faith is not sort of like doubt. It's mistrust. It's sort of being, you know, thinking unpleasant ideas about God, not liking him very much. In fact, expressing an enmity towards him. So how can I convince you that evidence is not the ultimate issue? You said, no, no, no way, no way. If I had more evidence, I'd totally believe God exists. Okay, well, wait a minute. Let me consider a thought experiment. Uh, let's imagine that, you know, if you're watching online, you know, you stop, stop, press, press pause, go to your room, you guys leave here tonight, go to your dorm rooms, and you say, okay, 
I'm going to ask Jesus if he actually is who he claimed to be. So you go back to your, your room, you pray, Jesus, if you're there, give me evidence. Give me enough evidence that I believe. There, there is Jesus, right there in your room. And he shows you the nail prints in his hands. Uh, he, you know, he, he does miracles. He says, what do you want me to do? You know, he makes your laptop levitate. He turns your bottle of water into a bottle of wine, but you're Baptist, you pour it out. Uh, you know, he does, he does whatever it takes to convince you. Whatever miracles you want, he will do them for you right there. There's no, until he, all of your doubt that he exists, that he's who he claimed to be, it's all removed. Intellectually, you are sure that he is God, that he is Lord, that he rose from the dead. So that's, I'm not going to ask you then whether you believe that, that God exists, that Jesus is God. That's, we'll assume, for the sake of argument, that question has been settled in your mind. I want to ask a different question. How do you feel about him? What if in that moment, he's just proved to you, to your satisfaction, that he exists. He now says to you, I now want you to go into all of creation and preach the good news. Tell your family and friends that, you, that, that I have died for their sins. I paid their debt on the cross. I rose from the dead three days later and ascended to God's right hand that I can, I can offer them a new life, and I can, they can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they can be born again into a living hope. And, and now that I'm your Lord, that means I've, I have complete control of your whole life. I have the ultimate say in your decisions. You have to, you have to submit to me your, your money, the way you spend your time, your career goals, your friendships, what you do for entertainment. If I, if I command you to completely change your career goals and do something else, like I am your Lord now. You don't call the shots ultimately. I do. You surrender everything to me. Now tell me honestly, doesn't that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Now I'll be honest, I'm a Christian, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Why? Because we're all sinners. This is the doctrine of sin. There's a part of us deep inside that doesn't really want God to exist because we know a God like that would be our Lord. And we want to be our own lords. We want to call our own shots. We want to be in control of our own lives and decide what's good for us without reference to God. Now, do you see then why evidence isn't the ultimate issue? I'm not saying it's an, an issue at all. I'm saying it's not the ultimate issue. Even if you had all, if we had all the evidence we could possibly need to convince us intellectually, there would still be a heart problem that God needs to overcome. But then, wait a minute, why blame God for not giving enough evidence when evidence is not really what we need? It's not the ultimate issue. Okay, I, I, maybe I answered one question, but I think I raised three more, even more important ones. Wait, 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 okay. You said that God wants to be found by everybody throughout all history, over all cultures. Okay, well, okay, then how? How did the uneducated find God, right? And illiterate people, people that just aren't very intelligent for various reasons. And, and wait a minute, number two, where do we even look for God's ultimate revelation? You're saying it's not science, fine, I guess, but then where? And number three, the worst of all, you're now telling me that the ultimate problem is not evidence, it's my heart. So how do I fix my heart? I mean, is there like a 12-step program? Should, there are some rituals I can do to fix my heart, meditation, what should I do so I can fix this heart problem? There's actually just one answer to these three questions, and it's the gospel. It's the central message of Christianity, and it's, it's interesting that, that, question, that, that the gospel itself answers these questions, which are very pertinent questions. Paul says this, defines the gospel, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You say, well, how does that answer the question? Wait a minute. This is the central message of the entire Bible. It's not advice about how you ought to live, what God's commands are for you. It's news. It's the good news of what God has done already to rescue sinners. The message is God himself has come in human flesh. He's taken on our very nature. He's lived the life we should have lived, obeying all of God's commands. He's died the death we deserve to die as rebels against God, that shake our fists at God and say, I'll do it my way. I want to be my own Lord. He died for that rebellion. He rose from the dead, conquering death on our behalf so that we can be completely reconciled to God through his death and resurrection. Now, 
the Bible comes to you and says, that's the news, do you believe it? Will you accept it? Will you commit your life to it? Now listen, how does that answer these questions? Number one, well, how do the uneducated find God? I mean, what if you're just not very good at science or philosophy or really any kind of educational stuff? What if, what if you're uneducated and weak and foolish and despised? Well, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Remember, the Gospel says the plan of salvation was God's idea. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's his idea. He comes into human history to rescue us. What that means is that God is not found through education, but through revelation. Since this is God's idea, it's not up to us to find God, it's up to him to find us. He sent Jesus to seek and save us. First question answered. Second question, where should we look? If not science, should we look to philosophy, art, experience? What's the gospel? Christianity is totally unique in, this, in answering this question. It says, God, uh, you know, not all cultures can respond to science. Not all cultures respond to, to art, the same kind of art, the same kind of music, the same kind of literature. Uh, but all people in all cultures can respond to a person. And that person is Jesus. God comes to us in Christianity as a person, as a human being that we can relate to, and says, follow me, trust me. Now, Everybody can do that. It doesn't matter how educated or uneducated you are. You can trust a person because you're made in God's image. So you can respond to a person, and that is God's ultimate revelation. That is his vehicle for knowing God is primarily through the person of Jesus we find in the Bible. Finally, if the fundamental problem is not in our heads but in our hearts, well, how do we fix it? What do we do? There's good news and bad news. The bad news is we can't fix it. We can't fix it. There's no, there are no rituals. There's no 12-step program. There's no 7-step program. There's no book. There's nothing. There are no classes you can take. There's no degree you can obtain. You can't fix your heart. The good news is that God can. The good news is that that's the gospel. The gospel is that this is a God who rescues, a God who replaces your old heart with a new one, a God who breaks through sin and evil and hardness and rebellion and conquers them with his love and grace and mercy. The, the gospel says, don't fix your heart, look and live. Look at Jesus suffering for you, dying for you, rising from the dead for you. Look and live. God will fix your heart, God can fix your heart, and God is pleading with you, turn to me. God is not found by people who, are, who take pride in how many degrees they have, who have, have everything figured out, who can understand all these arguments from natural theology. God is found by people who are simply willing to say, I can't find you, God. I need you to find me. So now, maybe you're not a Christian tonight. Uh, you, know, and you're, you're, you know, you came in here to hear this talk, and your head is reeling. You say, I don't believe half the stuff you're saying. That's totally fine. Uh, you have a lot of questions still. That's also fine. Keep reading. Keep asking questions. That's perfectly acceptable. Keep learning. If you take one thing away from this talk, just one, it's this. Do not weaponize science. Do not turn science into a weapon to keep Jesus out of your life. Jesus is your only hope. Do not take science and sort of use it as like a, a, a you know, a bayonet or a sword and just whack at him until he goes away. He is here to rescue you. So do, don't do that, please. Uh, and if, if I were you, what I would say is just start, yeah, I said, the place we look is not science primarily, we look to Jesus. So open up the Bible, read the Gospels, which Dr. McGrew just explained are reliable, and there's plenty more talks on that tonight, uh, or tomorrow at least. Um, read about him, read about who he is, but be willing to lay your pride at his feet and follow you where he leads. Now if you're a Christian tonight, I hope I've convinced you that science and religion are not enemies. Because God is real, all of creation reveals his handiwork. So science is a tool that should lead us in worship. I mean, science pours meaning into statements in the Bible, like God is great. How great? God is wise. How wise? It, they explain, they show us, they magnify God's attributes that are told to us in the Bible. But, but that being said, God cares much more about our, our love for him, our obedience to him, our trust in him, than he cares about our intelligence, our education, our knowledge, 
or our scientific ability. So remembering that fact will, will keep things in their proper place. We're not going to elevate science above God or reject science as incompatible with God. Now let me close by reading a quote from the original Rules and Precepts of Harvard University. This is from 1646. It says, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning, and seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom. Let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it out of him. You know, the founders of Harvard, Harvard were basically quoting Proverbs. They understood that, that, that all of our scientific knowledge, all of our philosophy, all of these this education, it's great. But compared to the surpassing worth of knowing God, it's ultimately worthless. So I, knowledge of God is the most important object we can seek in all of our life and studies. So let's always keep that in mind. Thanks so much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Sir, I really appreciated the talk, really gospel-centered, just mm -hmm. really encouraging. Um, you know, just, just, just a quick question. Um, I, get, I get to work with students, yeah. and, uh, and sometimes I encounter students who have really negative views about science. Mm -hmm. And so they just rule out science because what they've been heard or what they've taught about science is that science is innately wrong or, or rules got out of the picture. So what are some ways to really encourage students to, to love science and to love God at the same time? I, a good place to start would just be a biblical a theology of science and maybe nature and education in general. I mean, I actually gave a, a sermon on uh, science in the, in the Christian worldview. I, I basically elaborated on that point. I think I preached on Psalm 9, 19. It ended in 9. And yeah, I think it was 19. But basically, sorry, uh, I basically showed that God... Uh, that, that science pours meaning into what Bible teaches about God's glory. And we would be actually delinquent if we didn't make use of the tools he's given us to worship him. Uh, if, you know, if they have other concerns like you know, evolution or, the, or naturalism, you can put in a lot, of these, a lot of these things like in this talk, I explain why they don't have to be in conflict with, with God's existence. And they may have other questions too, but I think maybe just start with, you, it's actually wrong to, to, to hate science. That, that's, I, think, I, think, I, I hope that no one thinks it's okay as a Christian to hate knowledge. I mean, go back and read Proverbs. That's, that's not right. And, and science is certainly one way we can get knowledge. Uh, so I think I would just start with that. Maybe develop their, their biblical underpinnings of what, why do you think knowledge is bad or do you not think that science gives us knowledge? Uh, thank you. Awesome stuff. Um, when it comes to sciences... Um descriptions and whether arguments or supportive statements towards uh, the flood in the story of Noah, where's your stance and your kind of um, understanding of that and when it relates to inerrancy as well? Right, so uh, all of those questions I tend to not answer in public. Uh, just because they're so contentious and I, uh, they're also, the call for a very sort of nuanced response that depends on the person. Um, I, I, I just generally don't talk about that uh, unless it's in private. I'm happy to discuss it with you in person. Just because I like to give talks that everyone can listen to and no one gets angry and walks away. Um, uh, so if I can, I'll leave it there. I may have to talk to you afterwards. Uh, but essentially, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. Because uh, my, my goal in general is to sort of open people's uh, up to the possibility that science and religion are compatible. I think tending to take stances on these issues will just sort of polarize the audience, or everybody. So I'm avoiding your question. <laughs> Neil, great talk. Um, and great message. Hmm. I was wondering, have you have you read *The Privileged Planet* and by Guillermo Gonzalez? I think I own it. Okay. Um, and Jay Richards. Yeah, yeah. So I, I own it, and research. I think the so if you look at the way I structured this talk, I think I mentioned this to someone before the talk. In general, when I when I talk about science and religion, especially to scientists, atheists. I, I frame the question in terms of defeating their objections. So basically, a lot of those things I listed were defeaters. If naturalism is true, Christianity is false. 
if, uh, if uh, scientism is true, Christianity is false. So those are all defeaters for Christianity. I show them that those defeaters don't work. But then I, I, then I can make a case, maybe for God's existence, it's fine. Uh, but I'd also, ra- I'd, I, but there are lots of other arguments that I want to use to make a positive case for the gospel. Uh, my point is this. Privileged Planet, uh, I haven't actually read it. I own it, I haven't read it. I tend to think that we, we don't want to overpress our case. So a good example is this, um, abiogenesis, life from non-life. As I'm not a biologist, I'm a theoretical chemist. To me, my very lay understanding of having read almost nothing, it just seems problematic. Even scientists will say it's very problematic. We don't understand it. I don't mention that. Why? Only because people just have this gut reaction. I don't want to hear it. They, the walls will go up. They'll stop talking to you. Uh, I don't know why that is exactly. But I find that certain topics like suggesting that, that the planet Earth somehow specially, it sounds so spooky. I would rather focus on sort of very general claims that can, can point to God, make more firm claims related to the history of the Bible, the gospel, uh, things like the resurrection, uh, that don't raise hackles quite so much. And I just, I don't know why, maybe I'm wrong, but I find that some of these arguments, at least in, for my colleagues, tend to just, I just know how they react. Okay. And I just, rather than discuss those issues, I mean, I, mean, I can learn about them, I guess. Well, the only reason I bring it up is you brought up the fine-tuning yes, yeah. of the universe. And so this would take fine-tuning and say, not only mm. is the universe fine-tuned, but humanity is able to study the universe which doesn't make any sense. Right. That this planet is able to see the rest of the universe and actually have a view of all of the mathematical constructs in it, hmm. whereas any other planet that we can see would not Wouldn't have that, that viewpoint. So, so uh, I think the, the main, one of the reasons I would do that is just because the, with the fine tuning is already at like 10 to the 120th power. I'm not sure how many zeros you need to add to make that a strong argument. So I think it's already like, you know, it's going to be overkill. Um, and, and also, I just don't know, I know, I've read a little bit of the back and forth on, on the cosmological fine tuning, and frankly, I think atheists, the, the, the multiverse is the answer. That's, that's the response. And that seems, I mean, I don't say ridiculous, but it's pretty weak. So why bring up a, a you know, privileged planet hypothesis when they're going to have some other responses and, you know, whereas this one is like, just to my mind, it's ironclad. So I just, why, why add something that's going to be a diversion when this thing is, seems so, so powerful? Yeah. As a matter of fact, this will be the last question for oh, okay. Stephen. You can ask him a question probably afterwards. Thank you for the presentation, Neil. Yep. You had mentioned in your slide that uh, Wigner and von Neumann believed that quantum mechanics showed... Um, can you give the microphone? Please? Sorry. You had said that... Um, in one of your slides that Wigner and von Neumann believed that quantum mechanics showed um, mind-body dualism. Yeah. Can you elaborate on why they held that belief from quantum I, mechanics? I, so I have a whole talk tomorrow on quantum mechanics and miracles and materials from quantum mechanics where I do elaborate on that a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not super technical, uh, but uh, the bottom, well, I can't explain it briefly. You can come to the talk tomorrow. Uh, that view is not widely held by physicists today. But frankly, I think mainly because it's so spooky in, in the mind of physicists. Uh, I, I think there are, pro- there are problems with it. There are problems with every quantum mechanical interpretation, frankly. Uh, but that one is just sort of out of bounds. <laughs> you know, to suggest we have souls or minds is just so crazy that they don't want to even consider it. Uh, but there are, there are reasons I can mention tomorrow. All right. Well, thank you, Neil.